everyone. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. I'm just gonna wait here for guys to come up here. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> How are you all doing? Good? Yes. Uh, just to begin, I want this side to turn to your right, and then this side to turn to your left. And like if there's any empty seats, please scooch to the middle. Please come so that everybody that is standing around can have a seat. Too. So get closer to me. <laughs> Just walk in, walk in, walk in. Walk in this way, guys. Alana, walk in. Oh, is that my seat? Okay, never mind, don't walk in. Perfect. Now everybody's closer together. We want to say hi to everybody that is new. Hello, new people. Welcome to Praxis. We're so happy to have you here tonight. Um, and you can take a seat now if you are already scooching. I've been standing a lot in service. No, you're going to stand up. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and happy Sabbath. Uh, will the deacons come forward? Any of you guys know the phone number to text for a tithes and offerings? Yeah. My phone number? Ari, please. <laughs> Anyone? Just yell it. 77977. Someone tithes here. <laughs> Anyways, guys. Uh, God has been good. God has been good. Even... In the hardest of times, even in the best of times, God has been good. And here at Paxes, we've been very blessed by your support, your prayers, your ministry, and your donations to the community. It's been a lot, it's allowed us to do so much more and grow in ways that we wouldn't imagine during COVID, pre-COVID, to be in this position. And we are so blessed by that. So if you feel that calling, or if you don't, these guys are gonna, oh, continue, come forward. You, get closer to me. These guys will just pass the, the plate around. And if you are the random person to have cash, we are so grateful for that. If you have a phone, we're also grateful. 77977. And if you don't have a phone, God bless. <laughs> We have a couple more announcements while this is happening. Yes, we have a couple more announcements. First of all, we are having a 10-week summer socials. Um, anybody that was here for the cultural night last Saturday, we had so, so much fun. We had so many people and food. So we've been truly bonding and getting to know each other better through these weeks. Um, this coming Saturday night, so tomorrow night, we're actually going to be having Vespers at the beach. So to... Yes! Are you going to be there? Ooh. Yeah, I'm going to be there. <laughs> so you guys should be there too. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have some games, some music um, by the beach. So it's going to be really fun. Um, for more information, you can check our Instagram. There is all the details there. And you can come to me or Pastor Phil for more information on that. And something that you should be looking forward to and save on your calendars is August 7th. We're going to have a baseball game. Yay! <laughs> the cool thing is, you don't have to play because it's a minor league baseball team. So we get to watch, eat food. That's awesome, because I don't play. And I'll be there too, so you should be there too. <laughs> I don't play either. I just watch. I'm a professional watcher. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, uh, we, for tomorrow, sorry. Before I forget, you guys can bring some snacks, um, but we'll be providing s'mores, so just feel free to bring extra food if you get hungry like me at night. Here's our other announcement. Uh, Praxis, our live stream capabilities have upgraded downstairs. That's why we've been up here the whole time. Our live stream hasn't, no, I'm just kidding. It's a good summer. <laughs> We're out here because of the gray weather. But now, this is good news. For those of you that are not wanting to come anymore, now you can live stream. Come on, come on. Better, so, uh, no, seriously though, with this live stream, we, uh, we're in need of volunteers, so if you feel the calling of the Spirit, or uh, the calling of Pastor Phil's phone number, answer it, or don't. Leave a voice, you can leave a voicemail, but we'd love for you to come be a part, if you'd like to be part of the background scenes, running slides, is that the QR code? 
think there's a QR code. Yeah, is there a QR code? Or you can go to practiceministry.org slash volunteer, or you can just raise your hand. Just kidding. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we would love your help and uh, your assistance as we move this more towards online. I think one of the cool things for online service during COVID was the presence of people. It was nice to see that people were involved, even from a distance. And there's a lot of people that have left the community or aren't able to come or want to just watch the stream later on. And uh, we're blessed to have that up. So yes, praise God for that and we need you. We need you, we want you, and we're so happy that you are here. So let's praise God together tonight. Good at, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's good to see you guys. As you, for those of you that have been here. You guys know we've been doing an interview with elders segment, and tonight we're interviewing Matt Daly. Give it up for Matt Daly. What's up, guys? I gotta look up the questions because I didn't. I got handed the mic just a little bit ago for this, but Matt, what are you famous for? Um, well, it's kind of loud. No, is it loud? Just pretty good. Okay, so. <clears throat> If, if I had to, if you had to ask people that know me what I'm known for, um, it's probably inviting too many people to events that aren't mine. <laughs> so I'm the guy that like, like if you tell me to come and you don't tell me not to bring people, there's like 10 or 15 people coming with me. So if you invite me somewhere, just let me know not to bring people, because I love people. We appreciate your outreach and your inclusivity. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> All right, what are you passionate about in your life right now? Um, I think probably, I'm gonna go like with the ministry passion for this one. Um, I think for me, the biggest passion I have right now is to see other people grow, uh, whatever that looks like for you. Um, but for, you know, for me, like I love seeing people just become better people. And especially when they have a hunger and thirst for Christ, it's just like the biggest, it warms my soul to see people just like growing closer and closer and seeing the love of Jesus. That's awesome. So kind of like journeying with people. Yeah, I love journeying with people. Yeah. And if you guys know Matt, you guys see that very evident in his life and we appreciate that about you. So your career, Matt, talk to us about career and what you're passionate about in the sense of your career. Wow. Okay. Is this off? Is this off? No, it's not. Okay. Sorry. It sounds different. It sounds different. Um, my career, uh, I'm honestly kind of on a little break from my career right now, so I've been enjoying just not working right now, but, uh, that's okay. Man, uh, let's see. I didn't get these questions before guys. So, okay. The biggest thing I'm passionate about in my career is just kind of, um, I'm, I work in the emergency department as a healthcare worker and, uh, I just love like seeing people come in and like being able to send them home in a better state with hope with you know like helping with their pain or like if you someone comes with like a broken ankle or something like that and you put it back in and you know you send them home <laughs> something like that yeah just a little you know little twist but uh no i just i just love i love seeing people get better so yeah That's awesome. i can tell you really enjoy helping people and being with people in different capacities now, the final question, the one that gave me so much anxiety last week when I was up here. Um, pick a card, any card, and you have to answer both questions because I didn't have an option. Uh, okay. What's that? Oh, okay. Both. You want to read it? Sure. <laughs> All right. What is one thing that doesn't cost anything, occurs naturally, and always makes you smile? Wait, run that Would you back. like me to run, run that back? Run that okay. back. What is one thing that doesn't cost anything, occurs naturally, and always makes you smile? Uh, I guess people. <laughs> yeah, people. <laughs> right? That works, right? Yeah. That works. I love seeing people, smile. man. I love seeing people. Seeing all you guys it makes me happy. The smile on my face. I love it. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a very big people person. I think we've got to the end. 
All right, last one. What are you holding on to that you need to let go of? <laughs> what am I holding on to that I need to let go? Ah, oh, man. I don't even know. <laughs> Okay, my free time, if that makes sense. I value, okay, like, man, this is really just on the cuff here, off the cuff here. Okay, I love my free time so much. I need to let that go, but like, I love it a little too much. So I need to, sometimes I need to like, plan my day better to be more, more productive. Like I said, I haven't been working for like a month and a half, two months, and I've really loved it. Um, I'm gonna start working again in a couple weeks, so don't worry. But uh, <laughs> no, but uh, I think just being more productive, um, something that I need to let go is just like valuing, like not having a schedule, not doing things. You know, we can only do that for so long. Thanks for sharing. I know it's off the cuff, but thank you. Thank you, Matt, for answering the questions. If you guys want to get to know Matt a little bit more. And I just want to say, um, as one of the elders in this community, I love you guys, honestly. I, I don't know you. You can come up to me, talk to me, whatever. Like, I'm here for you, like, for real, so. Awesome, thank you. That's what I was going to say, but I'm glad he said it about himself. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Matt. And come back next week to meet another elder. Good evening, everybody. So glad to be here with you tonight. Sorry for the uh, pulpit stage, but I just like pulpit and I have a bunch of books. And so but tonight I'm going to share some stories, uh, share some biblical scripture with you on probably one of the most meaningful topics in my life and ministry over these years on the topic of relationships. I know some of you maybe even asked some questions this week on our Instagram. You saw some of my responses and you got interested, so you're here tonight. Others of you might be here for the first time just because. And so whoever you are, I want to welcome you to Praxis. This is an amazing community of young adults that are passionate about community, passionate about being connected together, but also about Jesus. And so on this night, we want to give Him the glory, and particularly when we talk about relationships. Everyone comes to relationships with a chaotic background. Chaotic because we're in a complex world with pop culture, psychology on what marriage looks like. Hollywood sells us a product that isn't reality. And our own very homes are combined with two caustic, broken people trying to show us what marriage is like. And a lot of times even they fail. And so we come to tonight with so many preconceived ideas of what healthy is and what healthy isn't. And so tonight I hope to share a little bit of what was unhealthy in my own family, my own home, my own marriage. And share with you also what healthy looks like from scripture and from other pieces of literature that I really have enjoyed over these years. And so, would you look at someone, tell them welcome to Night Church, but also tell them in a brief word, what is their vision of marriage from their own childhood, if you're willing to see it, all right? So, you have one minute to do this. Welcome someone and share your vision of marriage in one word or phrase from your own childhood, if you're willing to be that courageous. <laughs> Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, your people are here tonight, and Father, my prayer is that they would deeply know the God who is after them because he loves them. 
Lord, my prayer is that tonight your people would capture the beauty of the vision of marriage from Scripture, which would inspire us and call us to something greater than we've ever considered before. Tonight, Jesus, my prayer and my heart is for your people to also fall more deeply in love with the realistic vision of marriage, that they might walk into it with their eyes fully open for what you have for them. In Jesus' name. Some people might say, why would you do a sermon series on marriage to a bunch of single people? Praxis is actually filled with 85 to 90 percent single people. And when I say single, if you're not married, you're single still. So I'm like, no, you're not single. You're with me. You're still single. You're on the market. Terrible to say, but the truth is... Singleness is everything up until I do. So why do a series on singleness? Let me give you seven reasons, my seven reasons, why I personally think you need to hear about marriage as a single person. You should understand the theology of marriage before you say, I do. It's not about being right based on your childhood. It's not about being right based on unrealistic expectations of Hollywood. But it's about basing your expectations of the greatest commitment you're about to make based on God's Word. Number two, if you don't know what it takes to have a healthy and holy marriage before God and others, you don't know what you need to be working on as a single person. Number three, singles need to have a beautiful, God-inspired, glorious vision of marriage to strive for. Number four, Preparation for marriage is key because it sets, and the stats, I should say, the stats show that 90 to 95% of people will get married. Immediately, some of you are statisticians, you're like, oh my gosh, am I the five or 10%? <laughs> Number five, we live in a society of young adults who are too busy to get married. Statistics right now show that girls, average, average age, 28. Average age for guys, 30. Average. So many of you will get married in your 30s and beyond. Too busy to get married because of career aspirations and more afraid to get married because of the pain of brokenness in their parents' marriages, which cause a hell of a family life. And so they need to hear that it's a blessing, that it's good, that it's holy. And it's something that you should desire. Number six, singles should know that movies show you dysfunctional and utopic visions of marriage and love. In reality, a healthy marriage, get this, is boring. And should never get coverage and would never get coverage in a TV show on reality TV. Number seven, Christian singles are excited for sex in marriage, and you should be, because it's great. (laughs) But to have a healthy and a healthy amount of sex, which is, believe this, one to two times per week in a healthy marriage, some of you are like, dang, my bubble burst. You thought it was every day, or a few times a day, I know, I know. I do premarital counseling, and that's one of the things, at least usually the guys. And the girls are like, you know, yeah, yeah. they usually don't have a number, but the guy's like, like, like once a day, two. Anyway. <laughs> to have a healthy sex life, it takes a lot of hard work, self-sacrifice. And so when singles see healthy, they should know that two people put some serious work into this marriage and are living by biblical principles. And so let's set the tone for marriage in scripture. We have the story of Adam and Eve. But before we get to Adam and Eve, which informs us into some beautiful dynamics of marriage, I want to read to you from Ephesians. Paul gives us actually as a single man, a beautiful vision of marriage, believe it or not. Here in Ephesians chapter 5, and beginning in verse 15, if you want to pull out your digital scriptures with me, 
For those of you who are holy people of God and you have a real Bible in front of you, <laughs> pull it out with me. Here in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15 and going to verse 32, capture the vision of what Paul says marriage is like. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most use of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now listen to this. Submit to one another. Another version might say, respect one another out of reverence for Christ. True marriages begin with mutual respect across the lines. A man and a wife, a man and a woman, both have to respect each other, have submission for one another. And now, wives, respect yourselves or submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they did heed and care for their own bodies, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become united, one flesh, one body. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. <clears throat> However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. There we were, married, 2009, June 28. Just last month, near this time, my wife and I celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary. 13 years. We were 12 and 14 when we got married. <laughs> Just kidding. 20 and 22. A little older than you thought. And there we were, happy to be married, in love, excited. And yet on that day, in the beginning of the day, I had to process everything that happened the day before. Because this was the day before. Philip, did you get the slideshow completed? You promised. Philip, you promised. And there my wife-to-be storms out of the room because my procrastinating self didn't finish the slideshow. And her type A self became anxious, deeply anxious, because she thought I was going to let her down. And it's very possible I could have, except I've procrastinated all of my life and I've always gotten in all my stuff. <laughs> Besides the time, I turned in an assignment at 12.01 in Hebrew class, and the professor gave me a zero on 20% of my grade. That taught me a big lesson. Don't procrastinate. And so there I was, filling out this whole thing, feeling frustrated and angry. Am I really getting married? Are we getting married? Is this going to really happen? We got angrier and angrier as the day went on. Very angry. And the dysfunction of the anxiety of the weekend wore on us. And we started to genuinely fight. 
But this wasn't just the first fight because we had been struggling leading up to that day. And one of Elena's family friends called us to her home actually a few days before that and sat us down at her house and said, I need you both to realize it's not too late to walk away. The words coming out of her mouth couldn't have cut deeper and couldn't have instilled more fear into this anxious, just-turned 22-year-old and barely 20-year-old. And they are looking at each other, both crying as we had expressed the frustrations we had been feeling for months now leading up to that moment that was about to be our special day. It was a painful conversation. But looking at each other, understanding the call that we felt in our hearts almost 18 months before that, we renewed our commitment to each other. Looking at each other, looking with pain in each other's eyes, seeing the hurt we had caused each other over and over in different ways because every relationship has that, we renewed the commitment to hold fast, to walk down the aisle and still say, I do. But that also led to what I would say were seven years as Joseph saw the vision of seven years of plenty and then seven years of drought, it was reversed for us. For we experienced seven years of emptiness, destruction with our words and pain. Elena and I constantly, one after another, week after week, fights lasted not moments and hours and a day, but weeks and months and years. Now, we view this very differently, she and I, to be honest with you. Elena knows we had struggles and troubles and hardships. But me being the peacemaking person as I am, I felt it deeper. I felt it more profoundly. And I felt it at a level that I don't even have words to describe. But if you could bottle up the tears we both cried, it would fill up jugs. How did we get from dysfunction to dysfunction, to more dysfunction? Did we make a mistake on that day looking at each other in our family, friend's home? Should we have called it off? Should we have said, no, it's over, it's done. You aren't the person for me. And obviously, these seven years are a confirmation of that reality. This was not for us. We shouldn't have done it. It was a mistake. You're the wrong person, obviously. I'm not right for you. You have too many things in your life you didn't work out before you said I do. Your parents were not the best example. Your family, yeah, it didn't have a healthy vision of what marriage is supposed to be like. Your church community, your theology of this whole thing is a wreck. It's not worth it. You made a mistake. But there's a part that I love to now tell at weddings when I'm doing them myself. And I look at the couple. Where are Amber and Sheon? Are they here? They're here somewhere. They just got married like a month ago. There's a part in every single wedding that I absolutely believe in because I believe in it from my own experience. When you look at the person that you say I do to, they are the one. Not because of some miraculous way that in time and space you found the right person that the universe split the part ways through and you saw them glistening eyes and you knew deep in your heart, my God, you found her for me. And you know all your life you found the one. The moment you say, I do, she, he is the one. And it's at that profound level that you have to understand relationships are founded in. Because that's the way God built His relationship with humanity. Romans. For while you were yet still sinners, Christ died for you. Hoo, 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 hoo. Wait a minute. Genesis tells us the story of a young marriage 
that had just started. Glistening eyes and hopeful moments, beautiful, muscular Adam, gorgeous, voluptuous Eve. She was dynamic, he was strong, it was glorious, they were naked, they knew each other, meaning they had sex. These are code names in Hebrew. And they had a beautiful bliss. Is that how it went? Even the best of people, when they find each other, dysfunction is part of the marriage. Because you both bring dysfunction into it. But how does it work like that when you have Adam and Eve? They didn't have a family history. They didn't have a bad example to go by. They had choice. Every single one of us is built with choice to decide how will this marriage, this thing called love, look like. And it's something you have to choose every single day. I love how right now in society we are built on this destructive pattern of a self-focused love. In every space you find yourself in. Whether it's in friendship whether it's in romance, whether it's in family, whether it's in a marriage. If they don't make me happy, if you step on my toes, I put up the walls and you're out. You're done. We don't know how to do life with broken people. And yet, we ourselves are deeply broken. A book that I got on my wedding day from my brother and sister-in-law. A great book, The Ten Commandments of Marriage by Ed Young. Make sure you get a copy of this. Don't bust out your Amazon wish list right now. And here, Ed Young talks about this pattern of what he calls puppy love. And it's this idea that there is dysfunction that emerges when we don't understand how to love people out of a selfless instead of a selfish space. If I describe the first seven years of our marriage, I would say it was the selfish season. He talks about puppy love in this way. Listen to what Ed Young says. Puppy love is an immature form of the love dynamic that binds two people together. When we are in, quote, puppy love, we want to be with the person because of how he or she makes us feel. In puppy love, our emotional and physical needs take central space of that relationship. And like those pigs in a slop, we push aside anyone who doesn't satisfy or gratify our needs, even the very partner that you chose to be with themselves. And he gives this descriptor of puppy love versus mature love. Listen to puppy love. It focuses on receiving. Mature love seeks to give to the other person. Puppy love is impatient and self-centered. Mature love is patient in spite of the other's flaws. Puppy love tends to outbursts of anger. Mature love responds gently and appropriately to irritants. Puppy love is self-protective because it insists on meeting its needs above all. Mature love is transparent and vulnerable. You know, in Ephesians 5, it says that we must have wisdom towards one another. There in the text, Ephesians 5, 15, it says, be wise with each other. Wisdom, though, requires understanding. If there's one thing I've seen over and over in this young generation, it is a desire for love, but a lack of desire to study about and discover what love at its deepest core really is. I find that very few young adults are actually reading books these days. We're watching TV shows, we're watching movies, and we're not studying about the concept of love and relationships. Yes, some do listen to podcasts on thoughtful things. That's great. But I think we lack understanding and wisdom because we're not seeking out to develop our understanding of love at a deeper level. You've got to be studying about this, learning about this, seeking mentors about this. 
Yes, there is much to be discovered from our own family and the dysfunctions that maybe we have in our homes. But there's a lot to be discovered when you're passionate about discovering it and you study it. Wow. He goes on to then say here, Wisdom, wisdom is vital if we are to live and conduct our marriages as mature men and women in Christ. Unfortunately, however, far too many of us never grow beyond mere maturity either in our married or spiritual lives. While Jesus tells us to be childlike, immature people remain childish. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of two couples arguing in front of me in my office in the church for the last 10 years as a pastor, fighting in front of me. And I think to myself, my gosh, I can relate exactly because I know the moments when I too was childish. But if I could spell what childish looks like more than anything else, it's actually not spelled with a C, it's spelled with a P. And ends with ride. Pride. <laughs> that was a big one. Huh? When one or the other couple can. <laughs> Sorry, I just got caught off guard here thinking about that. When one or the other couple can end the cycle of pride in a fight. It is the beginning of healing. There's something in psychology and relation, relational psychology called the vicious cycle. It's the cycle of one spouse who tries to make amends and the other spouse, instead of coming near them in their effort to try and bring healing, buffs them. If any of you watch football, you know when the hand stiff arm comes out. You ain't gonna tackle me, you kidding me? Get out of here. And in relationships, we're constantly doing this to each other. Instead of opening our hands and just getting tackled with their gracious love, not as a quarterback getting tackled, <laughs> we push people aside and the vicious cycle continues. The vicious cycle continues. One spouse spews words of anger. The other spouse, instead of spewing words of, I'm hurt, that pains me. That would be a sign of vulnerability to do that. Instead, we choose the prideful tactic. Oh yeah? You're good for nothing. And you don't even know how to cook. And you know what? You don't provide for us. You don't even know how to have a job. And you know what? I never even loved you from the beginning. You know what? We're done. It's crazy how quick these things escalate. I felt them my own self. I've experienced them my own self. Dysfunction. Selfishness. Another profound book that you have to get that I'm so glad one of our life groups is going through right now is a book by Timothy Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian New York City, a phenomenal mega church with a church full of literally almost 90% of single people. And he writes his book, The Meaning of Marriage, and he's quoting Stanley Hauerwas, who's a phenomenal New Testament scholar at Duke University. And Hauerwas writes this, Destructive to marriage is the self-fulfillment ethic that assumes marriage and the family are primarily institutions of personal fulfillment, necessary for us to become whole and happy. The assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry, that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. This moral assumption overlooks the crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. We never know who we're going to marry. We just think we do. Or even if we marry the right person, just give it a while and he or she will change. And that's true. For marriage, being the enormous thing that it is, means we are not the same person after we've entered into it. The primary problem is learning how to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married to. The stranger. The one who's still in puppy love. You know, when I read this to you about puppy love, this self-destructiveness, 
I literally wrote at the top of the page when I read that back in 2009, just four months after we got married. I said, gosh, we're still in puppy love. But how do you get out of that? How do you work through that? How do you develop a self-sacrificing spirit? How do you get to a space where you can look at another and say, instead of choosing to be immature, I'm going to be mature. I'm going to look at you with eyes of love and not of Christ and to develop something that's meaningful here. How does that happen? Become an actual believer. Become an actual believer, not just, hey, believe, it's going to work out, but become an actual follower of Jesus Christ and find your will and your pride and your selfishness at the feet of the cross, crucified for you, this broken person. Paul writes, it is by faith we have been saved, not by our own works. And guess what? You're not going to get into a healthy marriage also by dysfunctional works. And so what will it require then to have a healthy marriage? Deep-seated faith. You and your spouse must become and come to a marriage with genuine faith in Christ and know His Word, love His Word, love the community of God, love the church, serve the church, be on mission for the kingdom, be in love with something greater than you. Because if you and your spouse lack a deep, holy, glorious vision of the kingdom, there will be only the vision of you. And when you wake up in the morning, you will look at yourself and say, Damn, he doesn't serve me. He doesn't love me like he should. Look at me. Look who I am. I deserve better. I'm more than this. This marriage is awful. Because I'm more. And I matter more. It's in those moments of deep-seated selfishness that unfortunately most of us are blind to for years and years of our life. But after you encounter pain over and over, and after, sadly, some of you might walk down the road of not just one, but two, but three marriages, at some point you're going to have to look in the mirror and say, I'm looking in the wrong mirror. But you're going to have to open up the Bible, and you're going to have to look into this text, and you're going to have to see that as the Scriptures and Paul says, the law of God is a mirror to us reflecting the character of who we need to have in our hearts and minds. There I was crying my eyes out on Barton Road. I had just finished a long night board meeting. I would usually go to Laguna where I was pastoring and I would spend all day there. We lived here in Loma Linda, Elena's in medical school and there I was getting off the exit, hitting down Barton, and I just started thinking the reality is I'm getting close to home, and I hate what I'm about to walk into. And I started the pity party, the puppy love. This is not right. This doesn't work. God, you gave me this woman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was angry. I was so angry, I started to cry. But I didn't cry because of the anger necessarily, but I started to cry because I was angry at myself. Because God brought to my recollection this passage that I just read to you in Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to read it for you again, what brought me to tears. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It was that night, almost six years ago, seven, that the transformation in my heart started to happen. My selfishness started to get baptized 
in the calling that God had given me as a husband, I needed to sacrifice my pride at the cross. I didn't need to be right anymore in every argument. I didn't need to point out everything I saw in her that I didn't like. I didn't need to be the criticizing one. I didn't need to be the one that wouldn't be there in the fight to stay in the game. It was then that I realized my life and my calling as a husband was to sacrifice, was to become selfless. I finally started crying because I realized I'd been doing it the wrong way this whole time. I'd been living a bad reality for way too long and the dysfunction was lasting way too long. And so instead of waiting for her to apologize, I started going first to apologize. Elena, I'm so sorry for what I did in this. I started to serve her deeper than I had done before. I started to sacrifice knowing that the dividends of payment would come not in the moment when maybe she would still be in the vicious cycle. I don't know if I trust all this that this guy's doing right now. He's being real nice. What is he trying to get? I don't want to have sex with this guy. What is he trying to get? Listen, if you want to have sex, you've got to be nice all day long. Okay? But if you want to have a healthy marriage, you need to get out of the vicious cycle and be selfless all the time. And so that night started a revolution in my heart and mind and body that changed me forever. Today, at year 13, we have a healthier marriage than we've ever had before. A passion and a love for each other that I've never had before. We have a sex life that's better. We have communication that's better. We have friendship that's better. We have relationships with others that are better. Ariana's sitting here, she knows. She was literally in the midst of all of that from day one almost. But you see, it takes time, but it also takes part two. Become a believer. How do you get out of the dysfunction? Number one, become a believer. But number two, recognize what covenant really means. The book of Hosea that Mariela shared with us a few weeks ago about was so important in my life to understand. If you've never read the book, you need to read it and reread it. First two chapters, three chapters in particular. You're going to be lost. You're going to be like, why did you have me read this? But if you don't understand the significance of the story, you will lose it all. God calls the prophet to marry a woman who's a prostitute. Some of you are like, gosh, they're always doing the patriarchy thing, putting women down. If you can put that aside for one moment, to recognize the woman simply illustrates us, you and me. We are not people deserving of God's love. The story is so ridiculous. Why would God call a man of God, a holy person, glorious in such, to marry a prostitute? Why? Because that's what covenant is. God chose to love a broken people to give them wholeness, to give them healing. And He didn't do it just for a moment, a year, a season, until finally there might have emerged some happiness here. No, He does it for eternity. When you say, I do, the only way to bring yourself out of the vicious cycle of selfishness is to recognize, man, this is going to have to last a lifetime I've got to figure out how to make this work because they keep hurting me. I keep hurting them. Does it mean we walk out now? Does it mean I get a buy out of this? In Jewish understanding, back in Jesus' time, do you realize that if a woman burned a man's bread, he could issue her a certificate of divorce? Their divorce status was, doesn't please me, you're done. Snap the finger, it's over. I don't like your recipe of bread. Right now on divorces, over 50% of divorces in the courts, they actually say, quote, unreconcilable differences. They just can't make it. There's no infidelity, there's no 
beating, he didn't get beat up, she didn't get beat up, there's none of that. And that's completely not okay if that's happened. And I'm not saying anyone needs to stay in an unhealthy, beating, violent marriage. Please don't get me wrong. But there needs to be a stronger steadfastness for this thing called covenant. Because you have to realize relationship, marriage is hard. As glorious and holy and wonderful as it is, it is also difficult. And unless you have this idea of covenant embedded in your soul, you will be as so many of my friends who've gone before me, gotten divorces at year two and three. Good friend of mine, good friends of mine, Dave and Katrina. They were happy, seemed like mission vision. They were committed to the kingdom, thoughtful, helping young adults, working in so many ways to bring about a more beautiful world, but there was something behind the closed doors that they never seemed to get across. She kept pushing him to do things in his career and other ways that he just didn't want to. And he felt like she was just not the woman that he always wanted to marry. And so the starting little points of doubt in both of their minds started to emerge, but particularly his. And he started to think, well, maybe if, maybe if I tried something with someone else, maybe I would realize if this really is about her, or maybe it's about me, maybe it's just about And instead of recognizing that covenant requires the sacrifice of working through your doubts and problems, there's no easy other person. Because Dave went on from one affair, realizing, ah, that's not working, to another affair, to another affair, and another affair. Until finally there was divorce, and a new marriage, and a woman who looked and said, I gave my best years to a man that didn't know how to love me. Covenant is vital to understand. Revelation. Revelation pictures this woman, a woman called the church. And the church in Revelation is a woman who, in many respects, is pure and holy and good. But guess what? The book of Revelation also says she's gone through a battle, Armageddon. And in many ways, marriage could be thought of as an Armageddon upon an Armageddon upon an Armageddon. There are wars and there are battles and there are struggles, but there are also, in the midst of it, when you emerge through the battle, is a woman who has become holy. Holy. How is that possible? You could get through a battle and be holy and better because conflict actually can produce something beautiful. Let's get to the straight of it. Conflict can produce something beautiful to a person who is a believer who understands covenant first. Because the person who's not a believer and doesn't understand covenant will see conflict and say, this marriage isn't going to work. You don't work. You don't work. This is too much. But conflict, if you allow the other person to speak the cutting words of truth into your life, it actually can shape you into exactly who God wanted you to be from the very beginning. There's only one person who's ever hurt me as deeply as my wife, and that's God. When He spoke the truth into my life. And my wife has said the truth into my life and it hurts. But if you allow the other person to be able to speak such words of truth into your life, and you allow yourself to receive them and accept them, you become a better version of yourself. A better version of who you needed to be from the beginning. But again, conflict can only do that to a person who understands, as a believer, that God has called people to speak truth into your life. And people were ordained by God to be called your spouse. They have that right to speak into 
there I was in my office some years ago here in Loma Linda. And a couple was struggling. They just came to medical school. He was busy doing medical work. She was busy just trying to take care of the family because she was the breadwinner. Her investment hadn't gotten fruition yet. After four years and more residency, then you know she could take a little break. But it was a struggle till then. She would have to provide. She would have to be the one that was neglected. He's got the books to be in. He's got other things to do. Study breaks are not very long. I'm not making it through this. And there they cried in my office, frustrated, angry at each other. But the conflict made them stronger. Because for the first time, she actually spoke what she really was feeling deep inside. Because they actually hadn't fought up until they came into my office and told each other the truth. He just said, something's wrong, I don't know what, could we sit down and talk to you? And with tears in her eyes, she told her the truth, him the truth, of what she was feeling, which was turning into remorse that they got married, which was turning into resentment about who he is and this thing called medicine. My brother one day went to the Little White House, if you know anything about the Little White House. It's where students can kind of take anything they have extra of and other students can come and take because they have a need for, sometimes they give food away there. And my brother, 20 years ago, when he came to Loma Linda, went there to grab some medical books. And he grabbed this one box and in the box there was this note and it said, if I knew Loma Linda would ruin my marriage and my life forever, and I'd end up alone and divorced, I never would have come here. And he's like, I'm not taking that box. <laughs> but there, that couple who was in my office looked at each other and finally, for the first time, confessed what they were feeling because they were so scared of conflict. They were scared of the fight. They were scared to tell the truth to each other. But when the truth emerges, the other person has the opportunity to receive the truth, to hear the person out, and to ask themselves, am I willing to change or will I continue in my pride? Will you change or will you remain in your pride? Do you want to have a healthy marriage or do you want to win the war? Do you want to actually have sex that night or do you want to be right? Do you want to be able to go to dinner with peace in your heart or do you want to just look at her and eat your food and stare at your phone? The reality... Oh, it's on. <coughs> the reality is that when you can address conflict in a healthy way that brings healing, you can end up at a better, stronger place. And I say all these things and you're like, gosh, he's talking about all these things in such strange ways, but that's the truth. When you, <laughs> when, you can have, when you can have healthy dialogue, your relationship changes for the rest of that day and weeks on end when you receive someone's word of truth and cutting into your life. Three things that I want you to leave here tonight if you want to have a healthy marriage. Become a genuine believer. Understand covenant at a deep core. And allow conflict to actually purify you. Make you holy rather than push you away from each other. Tonight, I don't have much more to tell you. But I do have a few things I want to just pray over you. I want to pray that each one of you understands the gospel is good for you Amen, and that it can change your way of doing relationships I want to pray over you that you would be a generation this evening on this rooftop that you as young adults would be so steadfastly committed to Jesus in covenant love as he is to you that it would transform your relationships going forward with your spouse and that you too would also be able to endure the searing pain of the truth spoken about you. When you're not living up to what you've been called to do, that you would allow God's healing touch and the healing words, I still love you. I'm still committed to you. 
even though you're a broken person. There's something about Covenant that helped our marriage in a profound way. There Lynn and I were again, a fight, an argument. But I spoke a word and she spoke a word to me that was so moving that I want to leave you with. We were exhausted fighting. We were exhausted. There we were on the other side of this parking structure in our little two-bedroom, 850-square-foot house exhausted after fighting. And I just looked at her and I said, even though this is so hard, I want you to know I'm willing to work through all the pain and all the hardship because I'm committed to you forever. And she looked at me and she said, I needed to hear that, Philip, because I wondered. She felt like she was too difficult. She felt like she was too emotional. She felt like all these different things, these insecurities inside. And when I assured her, I'm not going anywhere, it brought a sense of healing that began the beginning of our reconstruction. You see, I have a new marriage with the same wife. I've been married a few times in this spiritual sense. I've never been married twice. But I have a different marriage because I have a different wife and I'm a different husband because of these three profound points. Next weekend, we're going to jump into this idea of roles in marriage. Some of you are like, I have a role, I have a job, I have something to fulfill. And tomorrow morning and the next two mornings on Saturdays, we're going to have a Q&A on relationships. Tomorrow it's going to be on about singleness and healthy dating. So I hope that all of you might join us in the Sabbath school room at 9.30, 9.15 for a little light breakfast, some drinks, and that you would be able to dialogue with each other and even with me on this idea. Tomorrow morning we're lucky enough to also have with me our church counselor and a pastor for counseling and therapy with me, Jamie Stadola. She'll be there answering questions and going through things together. And so I want to encourage you. You can have a healthy marriage, healthy relationships, and this single journey can actually be amazing. And so don't feel regret. I know some of you on uh, the Instagram saw a question, or a few of you had one of this, like, why is there so much pressure to get married in the Adventist church? There feels like this is culture of like, rush, get this thing done. And so we want to kind of talk about singleness a little bit tomorrow, tomorrow morning in particular, and, and just the beautiful vision of singleness, actually. So I hope you're going to be there. But would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, thank you so much for being the God who is the one who said, I have died for you. I love you deeply. And you're committed with a covenant love that you will not abandon us. No, fa no matter how far we run from you, no matter how deep the pain we cause you and others, God, you're committed to us. And so, Lord, my prayer is that you would baptize my friends here tonight with the Holy Spirit, that you would give them a hope for marriage, that you would help them understand the blessing that it is, and that you would show them the vision of marriage from your word. God, thank you so much that through our mistakes, we actually become better and stronger. And so tonight, if there's someone here who's married, Lord, would you, would you bless them? Would you encourage them? The days are hard at times, and the struggles are real. But Lord, there are single people here tonight as well. And so God, I pray you would encourage them, that they would know that there is a partner there for them somewhere. And so God, would you bless their future spouse? And Lord, would you keep them and guard them, that they might use these years well before they say, I do. In Jesus' name, amen. invite you to stand as we sing our last song. I don't have experience of being married. Almost though. Uh, but I do have a little bit of experience with bad relationships. And all I can say is uh, make your own life an experience of worship so then you can make your relationship an experience of worship. Because God is listening.
And then tomorrow night, we also have the Beach Rest.